Gordon, fantastic for you to join me today, mate. Um, if you just want to give the guys a bit of a rundown who you are, where do you come from, what do you do, then just give us a brief outline of what we're going to go through today. Um, and then we'll get going and I'll just tag a few people in the thread and then we can get started. Sounds great. I've uh, been looking forward to this for a while, so excited to, to get rolling here and, and speak to your group. Uh, so as Greg said, my name is Gordon Corsetti. I run an organization uh, in the United States. I'm based in, in Georgia called Mental Agility. You can check that out at mentallyagile.com. I'm on all the social media stuff. You want to check all that stuff out. Uh, but I write uh, and I make videos about modifying the way that we think, uh, both in stressful situations and situations where we're a little bit more relaxed. And I take a bent of this towards uh, primarily athletes, which mental agility certainly uh, kind of goes that route. Um, but a lot of this is speaking uh, and giving tools to individuals, whether they're college students, high school students, working professionals, in Greg and I's case, referees, um, because at the end of the day, we all have brains and we're all human and all these skills that I've picked up over the last 15 years uh, for myself uh, battling depression anxiety and an extreme level of suicidal ideation I have found a lot of useful techniques a lot of useful uh, mindsets and ways of approaching different situations internally and externally uh, that are helpful to me living the life that I want to live and generally be healthier <laughs> physically and and mentally and emotionally and and that pays dividends uh, in my relationships as well so i was excited when greg reached out to me and said hey we, we we've got this group of uh, really time crunched individuals uh who are working professionals who was a group that you know i've I'm still very much in that, <laughs> working a good number of hours a week on top of doing all the other stuff I want to do. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the time management piece of that is, is one part of it. Uh, the big thing that Greg was looking for is, is how do we really adjust our habits and do that really, really, you know, keen eye to the science of our brains and how we evolved and what the real tripping points are. And then what's some actionable strategies that individuals can use specifically here working professionals who don't have a lot of time and really have to be regimented what can they do to overcome those roadblocks and make it more likely that they're going to succeed in whatever they choose to be doing here whether that's losing weight running a race you know starting off as a referee come join the dark side um, all those things are good uh, so in this particular talk, I've kind of got a few things in mind. Uh, Greg is going to be kind of jumping in with y'all's questions, and, and this might go in some tangent areas. But generally, the basis here is, is, is why we think the way we think, some brain science, some evolutionary uh, uh, biology and psychology there, uh, engraving habits, uh, some of the more cutting edge research on how to uh, really engrave habits into your day to day that are good, and, and, and more on to why this newer process works compared to old ways of doing it. And then lastly is tools for working professionals. Uh, my mother and grandfather were carpenters. I like to build stuff. I work with my hands. I'm, I'm in the utility industry and I have, I, I use tools for every occasion. And the same way that I do that in my day-to-day -day job is the same way that I'll do that uh, for the mental side of things. So I'll give you a handful of tools uh, that I've used uh, both in the utility industry where I'm working four 10 hour days and overtime and all kinds of crazy stuff on the field as a referee in lacrosse. Uh, and then uh, even in my old office job, which I did for six, seven years. Um, so these things, cross uh, age gaps, demographic gaps, um, cultural gaps. And I'm excited to uh, mainly be speaking to individuals in the UK. This is a, this is a second for me. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to kind of speak to this audience and I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to see where this is going to go with Greg and me. So uh, that's it. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. So I, I think, I think it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing habits, you know, and I think we, we, we touched on this before talking about this, Gordon, um, and actually, ironically, um, we actually did a, a, an episode of our podcast on Clubhouse. I don't know if you're on Clubhouse, Gordon. Um, we actually, um, see, not in the club, we're going to have to, we're going to have to get you in, Gordon. We're going to have to. Uh, <laughs> um, we actually did an episode of our po podcast on Clubhouse on, um, on Thursday, uh, yesterday, about habits. So actually, this leads in perfectly well for anybody that's listened um, to our short little podcast um, yesterday talking about habits and actually Gordon I, I know we, we, we can sort of elaborate on that a little bit more so I think let's let's dive in with that with habits um, 
sort of what's the what's the process behind it because i think like, like we said a lot of our guys um are time poor and i think they're stuck in and in probably habits sometimes and it's very difficult to change them so what's the process that they can go about to to begin to to modify those and and, and what's the process that they go through to to, to change them certainly so that it's it's a challenge, right? Like you, you've got all these other deadlines and, and responsibilities and obligations. And now you're realizing that, you know, health wise is, is kind of getting pushed down to the side uh, in order to be able to have time to do these other things. So you can put foot on the table and feed your families, right? So these are, these are, it's, it, it's a valid need. Uh, but then you look, you take a step back and you look like if your health is steadily declining while all your other work stuff is picking up, uh, eventually you're going to give at some point, like you're going to be able to do that for 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years. But eventually there's going to be a breakdown here physically, mentally, uh, relationally with the people that you're working with because you're stressed out. And, eh, right. So whatever your motivation is to getting a better physique or in shape or, or improved conditioning, um, I'm not so worried about your motivation on that side of thing because that's unique to you. And, and I've certainly been in that space. The, the challenge is, is can we step back? Uh, so one of the first things, and this is something, uh, I'll probably be referencing this book a good bit, it's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. You can go to his website, jamesclear.com. Um, I've listened to his book, I do a lot of driving, so audiobooks and all that kind of good jazz. Um, but he recommends uh, a, a very basic strategy. It's almost like a pros and cons list, but the idea here is to get a pen and paper, get a spreadsheet. If you're a spreadsheet guy, I'm a spreadsheet guy. and uh, just look at your entire day, like what, a, what an average day looks like for you. And you're just going to write down all the things that you do in a given day, personal, professional, whatever that may be. Okay. From whenever the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. And then the next column, you're going to write down whether that's a good habit or a bad habit, right? To you. And these things are relative. <laughs> okay. Like, so, uh, but, but again, then now we look at the context of this, these things. If you could step back and look at your entire average day and go, here are the things that benefit me and benefit my family and the work and, and the way I want to live. And here are the things that, ooh, this is the problem. Like if I really, you know, want to be, maybe, maybe, maybe the key thing here, it's been a struggle for me is, is wake up, go work out, right? That's a fairly uh, regular one for, for, and for time crunch guys, that's usually that morning is the best time that we have. Right. Uh, but getting that rolling is a challenge. And we can talk about that a little later. Uh, but if, if that is something where if I'm doing something where it's like, I'm just hitting snooze for eight out eight, 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 eight nine minutes, every single time, six, seven, eight, nine times. I did that this morning. I did. <laughs> I worked hard the past four days. I did. That. Um, but if you do that, you could write bad habit and that's maybe a 42 minute span where you've got some room where you can do something that's better for your health, whatever that may be. Bike ride, go for a run, do a rowing machine, do some burpees, whatever. Okay. Yoga is kind of my thing. So I enjoy that. Um, but the thing is, if, if you don't step back and take a look at these things, you're, you're kind of always operating with stuff coming at you and you have no idea what the plan is here. So I'm, I'm very much looking at, imagine your habits are some type of opponent. Uh, I take the mental agility piece. I used to kickbox. So you're looking at an opponent in front of you, time crunch, and you want better habits. Okay, cool. These bad habits that you got are, are the opponent. What can we do here? What do they look like? You have to be able to step back, write them out, categorize them, and then find those times that stand out that, that you know can reasonably be worked in there. And that's one of the, the more advantageous ways of doing that. And then the other big one, uh, I'll go into this, and this this I've done in every apartment I've lived in for the past six, seven years, is I get whiteboard paper uh, or a big whiteboard if I can't stick it to the wall, uh, and I put out a, just a, a huge monthly calendar, and then at the top of that monthly calendar, big bold letters, what I want to work on that month, right? And, and I mark out like on this day, this day, this day, this is what I want to be doing. <clears throat> and the research bears out that if you are specific about when, where, and how many times you want to do a particular task compared to a control group, you are way above 50% more likely to actually make that thing happen. 
So what I do recommend is after you get your, your habit list down and you categorize what those are, next step to that, well, step two here before we get into like actually making the good habits happen is to write down the following phrase or fill in the following phrase. I will, let's say, work out for 20 minutes, right? And this is all variables. You can pick whatever the heck you want. So I will work out for 20 minutes at least three times a week uh, on my back porch at 6.30 a.m. every morning or, or whatever, however you want to do that. So fill in the things that work for you there. And the research does prove, bear this out. If you write that down, physically write that down and then stick that all the places in your house, apartment, condo, townhome, wherever, where you're going to be able to see that regularly, the likelihood, statistical likelihood of you pulling off that behavior, even to a minimal extent, two times a week is better than three, is, is not always better than three, but it's certainly better than one and none, right? So these tiny, they call it the aggregation of marginal gains, is, is how James Clear would put it, is these tiny little 1% improvements. So if you can write that sentence down that fits for what you want to do, and that can change month to month as you get more fit or whatever it is you want to be doing, but you can use that and then put that on a post-it note or an index card or print it out on a full cardboard sheet of paper. I don't care, do you? And then put that on your refrigerator, on your mirror, on your uh, bedside lamp, on a big whiteboard in the wall, you know, on the doors you leave the house. These things will then keep inserting themselves into your brain as a, as a priority that you wish to tackle. So interesting, Gord, because um, again, I think, I think when we had that ha had our chat before, we always come back to refereeing, um, and <laughs> just, just just we can't help it uh, when you put two referees in a room. But um, it's interesting how we we talk about marginal gains and we talk about one percent um, in in terms of refereeing, in terms of making that you know one one percent change, that one percent increase on something that you did before, or some on somebody else you know so i i, I want to strive to be one percent better than you you want to strive to be one percent better than me and so i think from that perspective that's really sort of psychologically jarring for me because i know that works from a refereeing perspective so i think from a um from a lifestyle perspective if we aim to be one percent better every day and we aim to do one percent more every day that can start to filter through into the things that we're doing. Um, you know, absolutely. absolutely. So, and I, and I think a lot of our guys, like I said, potentially, potentially stuck in a rut, you know, potentially doing the same things over and over again. If, if they're not in the program, somebody, some people watching, if they're in the program, then, you know, that's where we look to change those habits and where we look to do that day on day. So, you know, so what benefits can somebody see if they're doing that in, you know, so, so you say you do that for, for every, every month, what benefit do you see from doing that month on month? So it's a, <clears throat> this is, I, I, I don't remember when I picked that strategy up to, to put up the whole month, but I remember where I got the idea, Jerry Seinfeld. Um, and a comedian, a starting comedian had said, like, was, was you know, headline or premiering before, you know, warming the crowd up before Seinfeld. And then after the show, he asked Seinfeld, he was like, hey, uh, how do you write so many freaking good jokes? And he goes, well, I, I, I do a chain method. Uh, and so what he does is he says every day I've got a bit, he's, he's got a whole year calendar in front of him, right? Jerry Seinfeld does. But the idea here is that he writes one joke a day. One joke a day. It might be a good joke, bad joke, middling joke, doesn't make sense, could be worked into something, whatever, but he writes one joke a day and then he puts a big X on that calendar. And his goal <clears throat> is to do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, repeat, and have X's, a chain of X's all the way through the entire year. And if he misses one, okay, that's gonna happen, but he's never gonna miss it twice. And that's the thing is, <clears throat> is the goal then is yes, establishing that habit. And you're probably going to do it for, <clears throat> we take the working out thing, you know, working out in the mornings, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, let's say, and you do it Monday, Wednesday, but something comes up Friday because you had a late night, Thursday night for work or whatnot. And you don't pull that off Friday. Well, okay. Are we going to have to make this up Saturday? No, not necessarily. The research still doesn't bear that out of like, you got to make stuff up. You've already missed that day. Okay, fine. Don't 
beat yourself up about it as much as you may want to. But on Monday, get right back on the horse. You never miss two days in a row of whatever your schedule is. And then over time, two to three months, that gets ingrained and engraved in your head. It becomes much more easily easy to execute those tasks. It's just something that you do. And then the idea is you just don't break the chain because you have established this. Um, there, there is an interesting quote. It's called the Stonemason's Credo or the Stone Worker's Credo. The guy says, is whenever I get frustrated about something I'm doing in my working life, like not making enough progress and whatever, I just think back to the stonemason. He goes, I look at a stonemason and he keeps chipping away at this rock and nothing's freaking happening. But on the hundredth and first blow, the rock snaps in two. And he's like, I know it wasn't the hundred and first blow. It was all the other blows preceding it, all that chink, 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 chink. That's what we're doing here. And, and the idea for this is, is that it has to be starting small. I have, I have aborted so many workout programs on my end because I just, I, 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 I took on too freaking much. And it's like, yeah, when I was younger and I was 22 and I could pull that off with my body uh, and I might be able to string together two hard weeks of working out like crazy, man cool, but I'm 32 now. I can't really pull that off physically anymore. I can't just dive into P90X or something like that. I can't dive into a Navy SEAL workout uh, and be consistent with that. I've got to, like right now, I'm doing a calisthenics program Monday through Friday because I want better balance with the type of work that I'm doing uh, and better body control. And so those are the things that, that I'm focusing on. But it's, I'm not killing myself every day. I'm making it more likely, I'm stacking the deck in my favor that I'm going to be able to pull this off. And then the, there's a pride thing here that becomes an identity piece of this that becomes very important because you and I have an identity as a referee, right? And the other individuals might be day traders or an identity of, you know, some guys might like archery and that's, that's a thing they do. Um, cool. But you are those things. We are those things because we do them regularly. Right. That's how we develop that identity. So if you wish to become someone who becomes more in shape, whatever condition that may be for you, is you need to build those activities into your day, small ones. They can be small and they will build up. It's compound interest with behavior is what this is. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think it's I think it's important because, you know, when like I said, when we were on Clubhouse um, talking about habits, you know, we talked about the almost the the habit loop in terms of where you know where it comes from the habit actually what it is and then the, the, the then the behavior and then the reward and then how that that sort of manifests itself and i think from from that perspective if we look at that and we look at layering it on little by little by little by little it happens and we feel good and we want to do it again and it, it, that cycle goes on and on and on and on until we're in a point where we go, actually, do you know what? I, I didn't think about doing that Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Actually, I'm doing it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah. And, and those are the things where they, they and, and they happen where like all of a sudden it's like suddenly you, you feel really great on like a Thursday afternoon and you just decide to go for a run. Whereas that wouldn't be normal behavior two years ago or whatever it was. You'd like, I've been in that space. I'm just like, damn, my body feels good. Maybe it's because I've been actually like eating reasonably well for the last several weeks and going to sleep reasonably, like all those things one at a time and once in a blue moon aren't going to do anything on their own. They won't in the same way that one cigarette is not going to kill you. It's the, <laughs> the cumulative effect of all those things. And the, again, James Clear talks about this. Uh, the other guy, I can't remember what he wrote, but the power of habit, he started off that circle of uh, cue craving reward uh, response reward. So that cue, that's actually kind of the bigger one. And the one I like to talk about because a lot of guys, myself included, um, because I am, very regimented in my thinking and I've had to work on that to become a bit more flexible and adaptable uh, over the years. Uh, but certainly when I was younger, I was like, I have to be up at six o'clock in the morning and do my three mile run. And if it's 601, well, damn, every, the, the whole day is shot, right? And that not true, right? But I didn't have that kind of flexibility. Uh, but here's an interesting thing. Cues, use your environment, whatever that may be. Right. So my cue in the morning is I have a sun lamp, a Philips sun lamp. And over the course of 30 minutes, it's going to go from dark all the way up to really freaking bright. No noise, no nothing. It's just bright light 
hitting my eyelids, which is hitting my retinas to some degree and telling my brain that, oh, it's sunrise right now. And I wake up very easily since I got that thing several years ago. Uh, but I use that as a, as a environmental cue. Okay, when, I, when that happens and now I realize I'm awake, now it's time to put my feet on the floor and go work out. As opposed to it's six o'clock in the morning, I have to work out. Time is a very abstract concept to the brain, right? It's just not there. Our ancestors lived for millennia before even discovering fire. They went to sleep when the sun went down. They woke up when the sun came up. That's all they had the option to do. So tie into that. Use your environmental cues. If you want to uh, meditate, it was like, I want to do it 15 minutes every day uh, starting at 8 a.m. Okay, you can, you can have that goal, but what's the environmental trigger that you can use as your cue? For me, it's my cup of coffee in the morning, right? That's, I, I make my coffee, cool. Now I'm likely sitting in a fairly comfortable chair. I get to the edge of that. And now I've used that cue, that taste, that smell, that sensation of coffee. I'm like, all right, that's going to be over here. Now I have my time to meditate. Now I go about the rest of my day. That is a much more powerful cueing system uh, and much more likely for you to uh, do the things that you want to be able to do positive habit wise. That also works on the back end. Uh, at the end of your day. So you guys are all working professionals. I, I assume, Greg, fairly a good number of folks in here work in an office type environment. Yeah, yeah. So uh, office um, entrepreneurs, so might be working at home at the moment. Um, yeah, sure. Property investors, people like that. Okay. Uh, that was my life for most of my 20s, uh, the early part of my 30s. And then uh, <laughs> I, I decided to move and totally do something totally different for myself. Now I'm in the utility industry. I'm moving every day. I don't really have to worry about that. Um, cause the day is done when the day is done. Uh, but the unfortunate thing about the, the office environment where we work in, I don't, I don't know exactly what the vibe is in the UK, but in the U S it's certainly freaking go, go, go. And we don't care that we're paying you for 40 hours, get the thing done. And, and we don't care about your personal life kind of thing. And you got to work with that. Um, so I, did, I learned, uh, this was a thing on one of the LinkedIn or, uh, uh, Linda courses. I learned here about a time management piece of this, but, um, uh, ritual. This is a powerful tool that you can use. Any human can use this, but it's powerful in this, in this space. So uh, when I used to work at US Lacrosse, uh, I would do this every week, every day, at the end of my day at 4.30, 5 o'clock, 5.30, right? Whatever that was. The last 30 minutes, this was what I would do, right? I would check my email. This is my work shutdown ritual. This was me mentally saying, all of this has got to come to a stop because I've got my actual life that I got to go do. And I get it. If you're an entrepreneur and you're working 17 hour days, that your, your time scale is going to be different, right? So adjust this accordingly, but use me as a model, I would say, uh, to see how this works. So I would, uh, the last 30 minutes of every day, I would check my email and I'd see is any, I'd rate what's up is, is anything, does I, do I have to get to anything right now? And can something wait until tomorrow morning? And I would kind of shuffle that around. Then close that down. I'd look at my calendar for the next day, just double check, see what's going on here. Again, kind of rate my priority. What's what? Then I would shut the computer off, which is a weird thing to do in today's day and age. We never freaking shut the things off, but there is an off button and it can be used. And I highly encourage you to do it. So turn the thing off. And then I, I, I had a laptop, working laptop, because sometimes I travel with it. Uh, work trips and whatnot. Uh, and then I, I'd close it and I'd put that in a desk drawer and then I'd physically lock the desk drawer. Then I would say out loud, I am done with work for the day. Move on to the next thing. And the only thing I would add is on Fridays, I'd take maybe an extra 15 minutes and I'd physically handwrite two or three letters to some individuals that I particularly wanted to thank or do something. It was a different way of kind of connecting in that, but it was also a way of slowing me down at the end of my week so that I could, I could think about being grateful to somebody else. That was a very positive thing for me. And one of the things that uh, I, I maintain in that job, but I, I haven't in this one, just it's, it's how it is. I'm not in the office all the time in a truck driving all over Atlanta. Um, but if you incorporate just a little bit of that, of, of, of however you want to do it for your working day, whatever that space is, um, you can do that at the start of the day of like, you know, some, I know some individuals who will, who will light a candle. I've got a particular lamp that I will turn on when I start work at my desk at home. Like that means I am started, 
right? These things get engraved in our brains and our brains love patterns. They love it so much. Uh, so if we can give our brains patterns for a day, for an average day, uh, that then repeats pretty darn regularly, it becomes, if you're an after work workout person, which some of us are, uh, that can be a thing. But if you never stop work, you never allow your brain that opportunity to kind of shift and go work out. So uh, use that. I highly recommend a work shutdown ritual. I've got those tools and different ones uh, also up on my website, mentallyagile.com, if you want to dig more into that. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, I get that, mate. I think, um, I think there's a fair amount of people, you know, I, I speak to a fair number of people every week that go, yeah, I get up at six and work till five and then get home till do sort of mess around with the family till about eight and then I work from eight till midnight on something else, you know, and they're, they're burning the candle at both ends and actually something like that that can help them switch off at the end of, at the end of a day certainly would be would be beneficial i think for sure um you know so how can and obviously i'm i'm i know people will be curious about this because we can we can link habits and we can you know we can make rituals and we can and we can do this but what happens if those habits are bad and what happens if we've if those habits breed bad cravings or bad um actions for us like like that for example where somebody's working a 16 17 18 hour day and actually that's become habitual so actually it never stops because that's consistent how can they break that loop how can you um so let, let let's go for two things so how can we break the loop in terms of those bad habits and then how does that link to potentially cravings for um for food actually which then puts us in a negative place athletically and for performance yeah, so I mean, the, the the first part of that question, that loop of you're in you're in that rut, and we call it a rut for a reason, okay? Um, but again, the, the thing is here, uh, when we're talking a, a bit of brain science here, and and I I this is where I nerd out on evolutionary psychology because uh, I do like to joke that we're we're we live in a modern age, but we we live with stone age brains, right? Our brains have not evolved for the past twelve thousand years of agrarian to modern culture. It just hasn't. It hasn't had the time for that. So we're still dealing with brains that are best adapted for the African savanna and living in small tribes of a couple hundred people and going out hunting, gathering, maybe growing a few crops. That's what our brains are meant for. We have now ask a lot of it and, and it does a lot. So it's, it's, it's cool on that end, but it's primed for this other environment. And now we have these new environments and the brain's got to work with kind of like outdated software in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that bad habits is where it happens. We are pattern seeking primates. You got to get that into your head. Our brain loves to find patterns. Uh, I know I do, but Greg, I would imagine anytime you're kind of uncertain, certainly like going into, into a, into a, a soccer game or a football game, uh, where you don't know what what's going to happen, you get a little nervous, you get anxious, right? That, that, that's that's not we don't we don't know what's going on there. So if we have good habits or bad habits, it doesn't matter. We're going to fall back on what's familiar. And if we've been working for 16, 17, 18 hours for the last five, six years, because we're starting to start up this company, because that's what was required at that time, we didn't know any better way to do it. Any deviation from that pattern. You feel guilt, you feel shame, right? And then that can spiral down into, well, you know, I, I need to put, if I'm not doing that, well, I'm going to uh, uh, binge eat or, or <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, veg out in front of Netflix because that's the only way I can't think about something. And I don't want to think about work or, or family problems, or relational problems, whatever. Uh, that spirals into that. And that, I've certainly been in that space, spirals into severe depression. And that's not a space that anybody wants to be in. And, and, I, and I hope nobody listening here is, but that's something I've dealt with for the better part of 15 years. And that's why I do what I do now. But the, the thing is, is, is just to remember we're primate or we're pattern seeking primates. Um, and there is a reason, you know, we're also herd animals in a sense. Uh, there's a reason most everybody follows the same trail in a forest, right? That it's been walked before. Our brain says we know it's safe. That this is, people have traversed this 
we, we're, we're used to this. We're going to keep on doing this. And you see this other little path that kind of goes out this way. That's kind of janky. And you're like, I don't really know about that. I got nerves, anxious on that. Mm, that could be, you know, lions, tigers, bears. Am I like, you know, that, that, that could be in that rut. That's what our brain is going through. It's worried about those threats. Uh, and so any deviation from the pattern that we're used to mentally uh, brings up that anxiety. And then those things go, well, you know what, I, I really should just stay at the office a couple more hours, or I really should not play with my kid. I, I got to go do this work thing. And it comes down to the fact of, you just heard me say that. And I say this to myself, you keep shooting all over yourself. And, and, and that, that is a, a painful place to be. And it's also one, it's just not a healthy place to be uh, because you start putting all these external factors out that you have to perform for. Uh, and, and you're not concerned about, about yourself. Like you said, burning the candle at both ends. I look at athletes cause I look at athletes every day and I, I wish our working culture um, had as much respect for the human body uh, and the mind and its capacity for recovery as we do in the professional sporting world. Like they get an off season. They don't play a game every freaking day, right? You can't play football for eight hours at a high level. You can't do it. You can't work at a high level for eight hours. It's, it's not physically possible. And, and anybody who goes ahead and says, no, that's, I can do that. I can, that's fine. You will pay a cost. You have to accept that fact. Um, so that's one to the, the big loop question there. Anything kind of in there you want me to go on to the next step? No, I think we'll, I think, I think we'll carry on, mate. That's good. I think that's covered it. Cool. So the next bit here, just like, okay, so we've, we, we're, we're in this rut. So, so what can we do about being in the space? I think probably one of the easier ones to do here, at least to talk about conceptually, is just food. Um, I know that is on, on my end. Um, so the, the, the challenge here is to like, if, if you're binge eating, so, uh, <laughs> when I'm in a very depressed state, I eat 12 at a time, Snickers, ice cream bars, and like a whole tub of goldfish. That'll be like my meal for the day. If I'm like in a severely depressed state of mind and I'm, I'm hating myself while I'm doing it. Right. It's terrible. Uh, but, but if those are in the fridge and in the cabinet, I'm going to it's very difficult to like, ah. Um, and one day I'm like, screw it. So I just smashed it all up and I threw it in the trash. And I took the trash, and I threw it in the dumpster and I cleared that out. I'm like, okay, fine. But then what happens? I had, I still had that craving. I was still in that rut. So what did I do? I got in my car. I went to the grocery store. I bought more of them. I put them back in. The and I, kept, I did that for like three or four weeks. I'm, I'm just like shoveling money out the door for stuff that I'm, I'm eating a little bit and is not healthy for me at all. So I'm just continually getting more depressed and more broke and, and more unhealthy. So that's not good. So what's a different alternative um, is, is to find a slightly healthier replacement. Again, these are environmental things that you have control over, right? So instead, like I love my ice cream. I, I've, I've, I've always had a sweet tooth. I blame my, my mother for that, but I've always had a sweet tooth. Love, love my ice cream. Uh, but that was becoming a problem. I, I uh, and especially on some of the anti uh, uh, antipsychotic medications that I'm on, uh, that uh, will most of those make you gain weight, or or you're always hungry, right? So I had to deal with that, and I ballooned up from 155 to almost 200 pounds uh, several years ago, and I'm back at like 180, 175. It's about a healthy weight for me. Um, but the the best way that I, I was able to do this was was I needed something sugary and cold at the end of the day, right? So those were the, that was what what I was craving that thing or that feeling cool, sugary. Great. Okay. So what's something other than ice cream I can do with that? Well, how about fruit pops? Okay, cool. And then so I, I swapped those out. And then after a while, it was like, okay, I'm just doing the sugary fruit props. That's still probably not healthy, great for me here. But I've I've modified my behavior, my environment a little bit. Cool. Okay, let's get like the, the, the more higher end, like fancy all fruit made out of real fruit, fruit pops kind of thing. And that's, that's my snack now. That's, that's my reward at the end of the day. Uh, and yes, there's still eat ice cream, sure. All right, but the only thing that's in my fridge is the, this now healthier option, but it still hits the craving that I want. Like I match that up. Uh, it's not like I'm sitting over here, I'm like, I'm just gonna X out sweets entirely. You're good. You're going to go to the store and you're going to get more sweets. I did. <laughs> That's just what's going to happen. Um, so uh, 
that would be my, my uh, suggestion is what in your environment can you change to make it again, more likely that you're going to engage in a behavior that is healthier for you, engage in a habit that is healthier for you and make it less likely that you're going to engage in what you categorized earlier as a bad habit. Yeah, and, and I think I think it's interesting talking about healthy, healthier swaps. I think when somebody's in that mindset, it's quite that's quite a difficult position to put yourself in, isn't it? To actually make that change because I think in that moment you're very sort of focused on I want that, mm-hmm. and it's very difficult to say, okay, well I could I want that, but I could have that. It, it, it's a it's a very different mindset to put yourself in, isn't it? it? It it is, and this is again, this is a challenge with with how we think. Okay, so our brain is is constantly trying to identify the world around us, and like, have you ever had that experience where you go into a new room to go get something, and then you stand in the middle of that room, going, "Why am I standing here? Is that a have you ever had that? Like, yeah. that's a that's a uniquely consistent human experience that I find fascinating. Um, That's known as the threshold effect. I like to call it the doorway effect. Um, And all that is, whether it's an environment that you're used to or not, is if you if you cross a threshold into something relatively new compared to what you've been in before, your brain has to take a moment and your your lizard brain, your more automatic system, has to categorize that new room for patterns and find threats and, and concerns. And sometimes that overloads the front part of our brain that is thinking more logically. And you forget that I went into the room to go get the phone charger, right? And then you're just standing there and you have to walk back into the room before. And then you're like, oh, now I remember. And now I have to go back over here and I'm pissed off because I couldn't remember that in the moment, right? So environmental cues, you need to change where you are if you're going to be thinking about this stuff with any clearer sense of being. So you can't do this at your office desk. You can't do this at your kitchen table. You can't do this in your bed. These are environments where you have already ingrained behavior, where you have already ingrained thoughts and actions that may not be serving you particularly well from a a health standpoint, emotional standpoint, uh, mental standpoint. So you need to change, you need to do this, like, like when I said before, we're categorizing behaviors or we're looking at this and we're saying like, what would I like to replace something else with? uh, So I'm more likely to do something healthy. You don't have to go get a hotel room, but go drive down to a coffee shop you've never been to before, or now in the age of COVID, something outside, um, right? Where where so, a, a completely novel environment that you 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 have not been in, or something that you haven't been in since you were like a kid, like that. That's where, and that allows that frees up some brain space because you're not in an environment where you have been thinking those thoughts. It frees things up. It's a wild way to go about doing this, but it makes life a lot easier when you're trying to examine your life outside of the usual environment that your life is in, right? That, that's the yeah. idea behind that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, it's, I think especially with COVID at the moment when people are stuck at home and people... Yep. working from home and like you say you know i think i think a lot of the a lot of the problems people are having at the moment i think uh, as people that i speak to me included i think as well is that you you're struggling to dissociate work and home and and that's a very difficult thing to sort of to do you know and like you said earlier about like the lamp when you're working or something something similar to that 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 can be really powerful especially when you're at home to try and break away the two because otherwise it blurs into one and it's very difficult then we we get back in that loop of that 18 hour day because it's very difficult to separate the two isn't it mm-hmm. it, it is and, and that's again the, the power of our environment and again the power of our mind so again think about your ancestor on the african savannah right what did they do they woke up when the sun went out and then they had something to go do so that they could go survive and if they had nothing to do, they just chilled out, right? Hunter gatherer lifestyle was actually, I mean, it was, it was rough and tumble and it was tooth and nail. Uh, but if there wasn't anything to do and you had food, you chilled out and you didn't feel bad about it, right? But the interesting thing here, and it's something I remind, um, uh, especially athletes a lot, 
is that that we humans now evolved from the victors we evolved from the ones that survived and so the behavioral habits in our minds uh, and the behaviors socially that that we have kind of cultivated now over the many years of, of humanity um, are, are the ones that whether they're good or bad are the ones that helped them survive then they might not be good or bad now for us right um, so when I talk about you know the environment bit and, and having to separate things and see new places there's still some weird research that um, anything green in your home is going to lead to a better mood any any plant it doesn't even have to be a real plant like it's just weird like so that's why i have two fake plants in my bedroom right i'm outside all day for work i see plenty of plants but i still want that in my, in my, in my bedroom but there is so much to be said for leaving the environment that you're in and seeing something a little novel over the course of your day uh, one of the things I, I do recommend kind of two things in a working day. One is a walk, right? Think of yourself as a cooped up dog. Right? <laughs> like it, 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 after a little while, after three days of being inside, I don't care what dog you have and how good it is. It's going to be running up the freaking walls being like, I need to go freaking outside, right? Think of yourself in that mode. Treat yourself with that same little bit of, of it's nice just to go out, right? Our ancestors were outside constantly. As long as you have a safe place to return to, going outside is a nice adventure. That's a good, rewarding thing for the brain. And it's also another healthy thing to do. You walk for 20 minutes, cool. You generally feel better. You think better. Um, I know when I'm having a problem, when I, when I sense awareness that I'm frustrated as hell typing the keyboard, I get up. I get up. I physically get away from the thing that's frustrating me. And it takes time to do that. When I, you know, when I started becoming more aware of some brain science, but also my own feelings and emotions about what I was doing while I was working, just being aware of how I felt in that given moment, and then being like, it is okay. It is totally okay to take a break. My daily schedule at my office when I was working, again, I was working at USL, and some nights I wouldn't get home until 1030 at night, because I was doing something like this, I would be doing a webinar of educational stuff. So I'd stay at the office from 830 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And that's not sustainable, but I did it. Um, and it wasn't a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, I did great work and I got a lot of accolades from that, uh, but physically it was pretty dang draining. And the thing that I, I, I've learned to do, um, and it's a little easier now in my, my line of work as, as uh, in the utility industry with, with electrical line work, but in an office environment, it's not really, like the environment never changes. The lights are always the freaking same. The house is always the freaking same. Um, the people are always the same for the most part. <laughs> it's, it's, those are, those are, they, they become so freaking monotonous and dry. And, and then you're just kind of in that rut becomes a, a, a pile of just quicksand or mud that you're just kind of in. Um, so, so, so change that up a little bit. I would do two things um, in, in the course of my working day when I worked at USL and then, and then later at CarMax. Uh, was a little, I would take my full hour lunch. I don't know if that's a thing at the UK, but still in the US, sure. they don't want you eating. I don't know why. <laughs> so you should be working if we're paying you. So, you know, that might be culturally a little, little different, but I take my full hour, right? That eventually took me some use and I eat for 30 minutes and I read for 30 minutes. Great. Um, I would take a cognitive recovery period. I actually had that on my calendar at about 2.30, 3 o'clock. I would say CRP on my calendar. And everybody would ask what that is. And I'd say, that's my cognitive recovery period. And they were like, okay, that's a lot of words. I don't really want to ask them a follow-up. That is a nap. <laughs> that, that is a 20 minute nap in a different space than I've been working, right? And I might replace the nap with a walk or a walk with something on that end um, or a walk with meditation on that end. But I put it on my calendar because it sounds official. Oh, Gordon's doing his cognitive recovery period. Now, all that means is <laughs> I'm calling a timeout in the course of my day, just like any other coach or player will do when things are getting and we are going into the fourth quarter and we need to be able to uh, perform at the same level we did in the first three quarters. Those are the things that I, I encourage you to do is build some breaks into your day and, and get over the idea that if you're not 100% productive 100% of the time that you're failing. It's not true. It's it's a it's a cultural thing that 
that unfortunately are, are part of our modern society has done. Sometimes the work is done and then sometimes the work has to be done tomorrow, uh, but tomorrow is still gonna be here, right? So we, we can't just work all the way through that period. We have to do things that do actively recharge us. Uh, otherwise we're just, we're, we're, we may be able to sustain that for a while, but it is a downward trend. Yeah. And do you know what? That leads me nicely into what I was hoping we'd get to, actually. Um, so uh, good job on that, mate. Um, it's, but I, I think it, within, our, within our actual um, our group, where we, we, with our clients, um, you know, day to day, that they're, they're assigned boxes or, or, um, and, and targets which they, which they have to hit. You know, again, we talked about habits. That's, that's about reframing their habits and trying to change those um, over time. But I think it's important as well is that sometimes they see, and it links a little bit to what we said earlier about not missing twice, because I think that, that's important as well. Um, but it, it links nicely in where if, if someone maybe does all they can, tick all their boxes, do all the stuff, and they still don't see success, their brain immediately goes, it's a failure, it's not right, it's not working. Now, why then do we, are we, what, is that, is that a hard wire? Is that a problem? Is that a cognitive blip? Because everybody immediately goes, no, it's not working. And, and, and it takes some, some serious reassurance at times for, for some people to get them to say, we are going to see this, this is how we can reframe it and this is how it this is how it this is how it's going to go you know i think what's your thoughts on that so i got two ways to answer that question uh so the first one is is yeah a little bit of of, of evolutionary psychology here so the brain fixates on the negative always it is it is an actively difficult thing i don't care how optimistic you are to be an optimist as a human being it just is. Okay. Uh, I am, I'd like to say I'm more of a realist, but I definitely tend toward the negative as a depressive, right? That's just kind of how my brain is wired and how my, how I've learned behavior over the years. Right. So, but, but think of this again, put yourself in your ancestor's shoes, the one who survived, right? Walking through the tall grass, of the African Savannah, and he hears a whistling or whispering wind through the bushes. What does your ancestor think? If he thinks that that is just the whispering in the wind, 99 times out of 100, totally fine. Nothing happens to him. Great. Okay. But if it's the tiger, he's lunch and he's not your ancestor, right? Think of the other one who hears that same whispering. 100 times out of 100 times, he assumes, he believes it's a tiger about to pounce on him and his crew. And so what does he do? He prepares his body, tenses his muscles, starts scanning everything, is ready no matter what. And 99 times out of 100, a tiger is not there. Okay. The, the, like, the, the, the thinking that, that, that the negative is always going to happen is ingrained in our bones uh, because that is how we survived. You know, look at the, the, the mathematics on that bit is, is the ones who just thought, oh, a lot, there wasn't such a thing for a long time as a happy-go-lucky cave person. They died, <laughs> they were dinner, right? The ones that were kind of freaked out and anxious were like, those were more likely to, to live, but we haven't lost that mentally uh, in our modern age. We haven't, it, we live in a remarkably safe environment um, compared to our, our cave person ancestors. Um, and that's something our brains haven't quite caught up to. So we're going to focus on the negative, that stands out. Uh, Greg, when you go driving, how many times do you notice the cars you pass versus the cars that are passing you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're, not, you're, not a lot. No. Yeah. You, like, like you, you, you're like, you, people go by you're like, yeah, but then you, you don't remember the 12 other people that you passed on your way going wherever you, you, your brain is cued to the negative. It just is. So that leads into, so, you know, I'm not seeing any gains right and that's other than the thing a, a little thing i don't like about the workout industry uh you know just of just, just like you know code beast mode it's all about gains 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 <laughs> all right cool you know it can be about just doing something um but the 
the again, this is our, our, our brains aren't so great at long term thinking when we're stressed. It isn't. Um, they're, they've done fMRI scans where they put dye in the blood vessels of the brain and stress a person out and it like sends stressful pictures, snakes and burning buildings and things like that. Um, and the blood goes away from the prefrontal cortex to more the base of the brain, which is more the automatic, more of the, uh, the amygdala, more of the fight or flight stress response. You physically get stupider in angry, stressful, anxiety ridden situations because that you can't cognitively do those two things at the same time. So if you're constantly stressed due to overwork, due to a poor diet, due to uh, not getting much uh, or minimal physical activity uh, and stressing out over relational issues, whatever that may be, you are not in a space where you are going to be recognizing long-term decision-making that is best for you. And so you won't be, it's like, I've checked all these boxes for two weeks. What the hell, you know? Uh, so, so, so what gives? Um, you're, we don't perceive those gradual changes very well. We, 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 we want big snappy changes because that's what our brain likes. It, it, it wants to be like, show me the whole picture right now. That's what I want. Um, but this is, this, is, this is pointillism, this physical stuff. This is popping tiny little dots on a piece of paper that you're this close to, and you're not going to be able to see it until until you've, you've spaced all this out. Um, so that is, uh, I think, a little bit of the, the, the psychology behind why it's so hard to, to accept marginal improvements over time, uh, and also why it's, it's, it's just, it's very difficult for us to sense those things. Um, so I highly encourage you um, number one, have a person to vent to, so you can kind of offload that thought, right? If you're a journaler, I'm not really, I, I mean, I write my blog, but it's a version of a journal. If you're a journaler, do that. If, if, if you know, if you have something to vent to, like, ah, oh, this thing isn't working. I'm sure JG Physique does some version of that and handles those calls. That's awesome. You need to be able to offload that from your mind. Um, uh, but then the, the other thing I would highly recommend uh, is just do a little bit of researching, and you can see that on my website, uh, mentallyagile.com, of cognitive behavioral therapy. What you're talking about is two things, disqualifying the, disqualifying the positive and emotional reasoning. There's about 10 to 12, maybe 13 cognitive distortions, um, and it doesn't matter if you're depressed or anxious or bipolar or schizophrenic or whatever. Again, humans, we all have brains, so we all, we, we all have the, percept, the, the possibility that our mental lens is going to get a little wonky, right? So uh, I use cognitive behavioral therapy. They're called thought records. And in the same way that I would write down my behaviors and the things that I want to do, kind of plan out my week on my big whiteboard, I, I, I spent 10 years writing down thought records where I would say, you know, one of them very commonly would be, I'm never going to lose weight, right? When I was peaking at almost 200 pounds uh, and on my frame at 5'9", not a good <laughs> not a good weight uh, on that. And I'm frustrated on that bit. I'm never going to lose weight because I'm working out all the time. And this is, I'm still not seeing anything. Okay. What type of thought is that? That's step number two. Step number one, you write down your negative automatic thought, your gnat. Then step two, you identify it. That is disqualifying the positive uh, because I'm doing good things. I, I know logically that's in there, but emotionally, I don't feel that. Emotion is going to win over logic if you don't look long term, right? So I say that's, that's disqualifying the positive and it's called emotional reasoning. There are several others. Those are kind of my go-to, but emotional reasoning is, is the, the catch-all uh, if you can't find the category, because what that states is if I feel it's true, then it is true, which is complete BS, right? Feelings aren't truth. You, you may be feeling something and I'll validate that. They do not always correspond to reality. Right. And so emotional reasoning, you'd be on that bit of, of just like, I'll, you know, I'll never lose weight. So what is, you know, another donut or another piece of cake or in my case, what's another Snickers bar uh, going to really do for this bit? I did work out so great. So let me eat that. And, and then that that cancels out some of the work I've been doing. So you write your thought, your negative thought, you categorize it, and then you have to attack it with logic. This is the longest step. So this is where I've, I've gone with, no, I've, I've, you attack it with historical truths that you know to be true. And if you don't have any, ask people around you that know you, they'll have some of, 
no, I, I, I am consistently working out three times a week. Uh, I am, you know, spending two hours on a Saturday walking around the lake and uh, with my friends. Uh, I am going to referee a lacrosse game and I have lost weight before, right? So all these things start overpowering the emotional side of that equation. Uh, and when done over time, I don't have to write this down anymore. I've been doing it for 10 years. I, I recognize my distortions pretty darn quickly. I have to, I'm a depressive. Um, but you, anybody can develop that skill. And it's it's a little bit of, of, uh, of, of emotional know-how of, of, of just thinking about thinking um, and, and a sense of awareness about, about how you're going about your day. Um, it's a challenge to do. Highly recommend. You can check out all that stuff on my website. Uh, and Mike, you can always contact me if you got questions on that kind of stuff. If you want to dive deeper into that. But I'd highly recommend just Googling thought records, cognitive behavioral therapy. You'll be able to find some better ways to address those negative thoughts that are coming in when you're just in the grind and you're not seeing anything. Absolutely. And you know what? That links very nicely back to marginal gains as well, doesn't it? Because actually yep. the 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 thought process of it's not working actually goes back to well as long as you've been doing the the, the the right stuff over time those marginal gains will eventually add up you know and that's why we would preach to take photos and measurements because actually those marginal gains will show when when you look at that as well so you know that, like you say that short-term emotion of oh it's not working because maybe the scale's gone up or it's not moved, actually the marginal gain says that over time that result will appear. Absolutely. That's that's the thing. And, and that's one of those things of, of emotion is a visual experience and is very difficult for us to, to override, um, especially when, when we're in a stressed state, right? You work for 17 hours and you worked out that day as well. Great. Uh, but you get onto your scale the next morning and nothing changed. And you're like, what the, or maybe you gained a pound and a half. And you're like, what the hell? Like, I've had that happen. I'm like, I didn't eat anything different. What's my body doing? This is stupid. Um, and emotionally you have that reaction. You're just like, ah, screw it. Um, but if you have historical data and if you have logic and truths supporting that logic and, and you are able to write that stuff down, all right, not just conceptually think about it. These have to be written down. They have to be in black and white for your brain to be like, this is a pattern I can accept. Then that logic over time starts winning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, I'm just trying to see if there's any if there's any questions at the moment. Yeah, but I don't think there is. But I think, Gordon, we've covered quite a lot there. <laughs> yeah, a good <laughs> bit. Covered, yeah, for we've, sure. We've, we've covered a heck of a lot. Um, but... If, if somebody's tuning in now, we've nearly been on an hour. Um, what what could you what could you summarise? Maybe give us three three points that we can summarise that we can bring together. That that if somebody tunes in now and thinks, "Ah, oh, crap, I've missed up missed all of it." Um, how can we summarise what we've been through and what we've what we've talked about and and what somebody could potentially tune in now and take away from and still take some value from it. Certainly. So you know, three things. I mean, starting off, uh, number one is step back from your life and look at it with the critical eye that you want. Make sure you're in a mental space to be able to do that. Right. Make sure you're relaxed in that space. Like do whatever. If you need to go take a hot bath and, and whatever, just to physically calm the heck down uh, or eat a good meal, your favorite meal. I don't care if it's healthy or not. Just something that that does get you in a relaxed mindset. Step back and look at your life, categorize your daily habits, and then rank them good or bad, right? And, and then you'll be able to start seeing those time spaces where you can replace certain things with better things. Um, I would say, again, highly encourage anybody out there um, to go check out jamesclear.com. He's the author of Atomic Habits. Uh, this is going to explain a lot more of the psychology and the science that Greg and I have been talking about tonight in a very accessible way as to why we think the way we think and why it's so hard to start new habits uh, and generally because we're, we're biting off too much or we have unrealistic expectations. Uh, so that would be number two. Number three, my other one here would, would, would be to, to be curious about yourself. 
right? That that's kind of how I would wrap up the, like the last bit that we talked about with cognitive behavioral therapy. Be curious about your own thoughts. If I could give one huge tip, it would be be aware of any time you're saying you should do something or you shouldn't do something, right? That is, I, I am very aware of that word in my head and when I say it, and I'm very careful about how I use it because generally it's a scolding type of word internally or externally. It comes from the old English word skilled. <laughs> it's a scold, right? That it's, it's not really a great word in that space. So don't use that in your head. Or if you do be aware of it and be like, do I really need to do this thing? Replace should with need. And then you could be like, I, you know, I shouldn't eat, uh, you know, I should eat that donut or something like that. Or I shouldn't have eaten that donut. That might be a better one. I shouldn't have eaten that, that thing that's bad. Or I shouldn't have not worked out, whatever. I need to work out tomorrow. I need to have a healthy salad option tomorrow, whatever that is, a healthy herb. So you start going into needs um, and, and base human needs as opposed to these shoulds, uh, which, which carry a lot more kind of psychic weight to them um, that, that is just more difficult to deal with. So replace, I'd say, again, step back within your life, categorize everything, go check out jamesclear.com. If you want to check out mentallyagile.com, my website, go to do that too. Uh, and then number three would be stop shooting all over yourself. <laughs> Get curious and be aware of kind of, 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 of just learning how you're thinking. Absolutely. And you know what? I think that, that you know, that, that um, advice there of using need rather than should is, is a massive one to finish with in terms of people understanding um, their thought processes and how they can, really sort of start start to modify those you know at the end of the day we shouldn't we shouldn't have to do something it should be that we you know we we need to do it you know and we should and we should see a value from doing it so mate that, that that's absolutely invaluable advice and um i'm sure that we've we've covered a whole breadth of things here and i'm sure people can take a massive um a wealth of, of knowledge away um i've just put those three things in the comments as well for people to um to just to just sort of pop in there as well um so hopefully they can they can dive into those um but at the moment mate there's no questions luckily it means it's what on one hand that shows we've been extensively thorough in what we've discussed so you know that's the, that that's a great thing but um if there is anything that, that comes up mate in terms of questions um when more people watch it i'll pass those over to you for sure um if, if need be and um but just just leaves me to say mate thank you so much for joining me because it's been uh been insightful for me it's been insightful for everybody else I'm, I'm sure um so thank you very much mate and um i'm sure we can we can do it again soon um but thank you for your your insight and advice and um i'm sure people will have taken a lot from it mate so um thank you so much guys